Um, Judson Brewer is uh, actually a practitioner and has been practicing meditation for 10 to 15 years, and that informs his research. He's assistant professor of psychiatry and the medical director of the Yale Therapeutic Neuroscience Clinic at the Yale School of Medicine. He received his MD, PhD from Washington University in St. Louis. His research focuses on neurobiological mechanisms underlying the interface between stress, mindfulness, and the addictive process, and in developing effective means for modulating those processes to better treat substance use disorders. Please welcome me, uh, welcome, don't welcome me, welcome Judson. What I'd like to do today is really briefly touch on uh, what uh, Jimpo was talking about in terms of the seed of compassion, loving kindness meditation, and how this relates to self-referential networks. And these networks, you, if you can uh, keep Brian's slides in mind, um, are gonna be very um, important in this discussion. So the organizer asked me to talk about myself. Well, um, I'm happy to talk about myself, and it turns out that many people are happy to talk about themselves. So the nucleus accumbens is actually activated when people talk about themselves. This study was particularly interesting because these people, while they were in the scanner, they were given a choice to earn money or talk about themselves. <laughs> Guess what they did? <laughs> the problem here is, and this is where it comes to my personal interest, is that this type of stuff I've been starting to learn isn't actually bringing me a lot of happiness. And so I think um, this has really it piqued my personal interest in meditation and studying this stuff to see what's actually going on. So my expertise and approach, um, well, I would say I'm an expert in one thing, which is I'm an expert in suffering. Now, what do I mean by this? I've logged many, many, many hours. I think this is a conservative estimate, but by some accounts, 10,000 means that you're an expert. My approach, um, so we've done some clinical studies with mindfulness training for addictions. I'm an addiction psychiatrist. I'm not going to talk about those today, but if you're interested, I'm happy to talk about those afterwards. What I'll focus on today is some of the neural mechanisms of meditation. So again, back to my personal interest. Again, I'm an expert in, in suffering, and I'll just give a personal example. So I like to ride my bike to work, and you know, I ride my bike in a car perhaps is not ex as excited about me riding my bike to work, and so they honk it, so pretend, sometimes I get uh, somebody honking at me, and that doesn't feel very good, and my brain says, you're gonna take that? You're gonna you know, you let that guy honk at you? You had the right of way or whatever, and so my brain says, do something, and so I'll get in front of the car, I'll give them some choice words, or give them a few finger gestures, and that lays down this, you know, I feel better temporarily, and this lays, what I was learning was this is actually laying down this, this habit circuit, this reward pathway that said, oh, well, next time somebody honks at you, do that again. And what I found was this was kind of perpetuating itself. And the more I would do it, the more, the stronger it would get, or I would, I would arrive at work angry and tell a coworker, you know, I can't believe these cars, or whatever. So this, for those of you that are familiar with operant conditioning, this might look familiar. So I was s doing a classic negative reinforcement. So is this the first time that positive in, or negative reinforcement has been described? I think perhaps as Jinpa and others have suggested, way back in the Buddhist time, uh, I think the Buddha may have been the earliest documented psychologist. And in fact, our operant conditioning processes, positive and negative reinforcement, have been described 2,500 years ago with just slightly different, not that much different, but slightly different uh, terminology. So the if we have a trigger or a cue that comes into the brain, it gets interpreted as pleasant or unpleasant. And this induces us to want to do something about it. So we, we want the pleasant to continue. We want the unpleasant to go away. So we do something about it. And when we do something, and according to the ancient terminology, this leads to the birth of a self-identity. And this memory gets laid down, so we reinforce the process. So it's all about me. And literally, this is self-propagating and is termed in, in samsara, this endless wandering, because all it does is perpetuate itself. So what I found was during, when I was meditating myself, I started doing loving kindness practice. And I would do this begrudgingly at first, you know, okay, I'm just gonna use this as concentration, you know, I'm a scientist, I don't know what this touchy-feely kumbaya stuff is. Um, but I also started realizing the more I practiced it, it actually felt pretty good. And I noticed the more I practiced, I would ride to work and somebody would honk at me and this anger would come up. And I would find myself uh, giving myself some phrases of loving kindness, you know, may I be happy, and giving phrases to the, to the driver and the, the anger wouldn't get its teeth sunk in. And I also found that this started laying down a different type of reward-based process 
where I would start, uh, I didn't actually need people to honk at me to start doing metta, and I started doing metta for drivers, any driver that I would see as I would ride to work, and it was tremendously transformative. I would get to work and it would be, I would be happy to be there as compared to, you know, I couldn't wait to tell who, you know, how bad the drivers were. So that's my personal experience. It's been a tremendously transformative experience for me, uh, myself. So I got very interested in looking at the neural mechanisms, and there wasn't a lot known at the time. This was about f five or six years ago that I started uh, doing some research with this. But I think there was a lot more known about kind of some of the opposite things um, with regard to mindfulness, so mindlessness. I'm just going to go through a very quick study um, where there was a study that was done at Harvard a few years ago where they found that 50% of the time of our waking life, um, our minds are wandering. So if you pay attention for half of this lecture, you're on average. Um, but what they also found was when they asked people, when you're not paying attention, when your mind's wandering, are you happy or are you not happy? They found that they're no happier when they're thinking about their greatest Hawaiian vacation or their, their best fantasy. And what they concluded was that a wandering mind is an unhappy mind. So there, because this is such a prevalent process, this has actually been um, studied neuroscientifically, and there's a network of structures that now seems to be involved in this way of being that's aptly dubbed the default mode network, because this is what we default to. And I'm going to focus on the two main structures of the default mode, and those were actually um, activated in, in Brian's study, the medial prefrontal cortex and the posterior cingulate. Now here's a, here's a study that, was illustrate, that illustrates this. So Sue Whitfield Gabrielli at MIT did a study where she had people just lay in the scanner and not do anything in particular. Those are the standard default mode instructions. And then they also did a separate task where they had them look at adjectives and ask them if they described them, a, a typical self-referential process. And what, they, <clears throat> what she did was she did a conversion analysis where she looked to see where there was common overlap, where, where brain regions were activating during this default mode task and also during the self-referential task. And you can see here in green that the medial prefrontal cortex and the posterior cingulate are both activated, um, both when people are told not to do anything in particular and also when they're doing self-referencing. And what we can conclude from this and a lot of other literature is that when we're, when we're left to our own devices, we think about things regard, related to ourselves, and this may be uh, rewarding as that first paper showed. So how can we step out of ourselves and step out of these self-reinforcing processes to be more present in the present? So we turned to the experts, and we did a small study with uh, 12 very experienced meditators, again, on some scales, the 10, hour, they meet the 10,000-hour rule, and also uh, 12 very well-matched uh, novice controls that we taught to meditate that morning. And what we had people do, I'm just going to go through these very quickly, um, we had them do three standard meditation practices. One was just pay attention to your breath, you don't have to read this. Um, we also had them do loving-kindness practice where we had them in, uh, intentionally wish well to others and specifically to all beings. We had them choose phrases of their own choosing, so we gave them some examples. For example, be, you know, may all beings be happy, may all beings be healthy. And we also had them do a choiceless awareness task where we said, just pay attention to whatever comes into your awareness. Don't, don't try to fixate on anything in particular. And what you can see here is that attention in concentration practice is directed at a single physical object, typically. Um, with loving kindness, it can be directed at physical and mental objects if you're, if you're visualizing someone. And with choiceless awareness, the attention is directed but not focused at anything in particular. And what we, can, what we can hypothesize is that the task common to all of these meditation techniques may be that the training of attention away from self-reference and mind-wandering toward one's immediate experience. So don't feed the self. Really? Don't feed the self? How can you be doing something without you doing something? Now, one of our NIH grant reviewers wondered the same thing. He said, the sense of acceptance of present moment experience involves some kind of perspective on oneself. Likewise, the wish to, for others to be happy in loving kindness meditation is a wish from someone, not no one, and embodies an action tendency and intentionality, which are aspects of the self. Well, I would argue this is an empirical question. So what we did was test this. And you can guess I didn't get the grant. So we had people lay still and not do anything in particular. We gave them instructions over headphones to do the three different types of meditation, and we had them do each of these twice in a randomized order. And just to summarize these, because I don't want to go into all of the details, but just to fo so we can move on to the loving kindness in particular, what we found was across all three meditations, there was a common deactivation. So blue is deactivation in experienced meditators con compared to controls. Now, do these brain regions look familiar? Yes, these are the two main nodes of the default mode network. And very similar to the regions, I think, just glancing at them, that Brian showed were activated in college students practicing compassion. So when we look more closely, you can see 
choiceless awareness here is in green, loving kindness is in red, and concentration is in blue. And you can see in the, both the medial prefrontal cortex and the posterior cingulate that they're commonly deactivated in experienced meditators compared to controls. So we didn't, you know, one study, it's a small study, these could be super meditators or whatnot. So we actually replicated this to see if this was actually true. And we roughly doubled our sample size. So these are unpublished data that we've just analyzed. But, and I'm just going to focus on loving kindness today. But you can see here, again, comparing experienced meditators to novices, that we see a decreased activity in the posterior cingulate. So this, is, this was affirming, uh, we took this one step further and we did a, a separate analysis called intrinsic connectivity. So for those that aren't familiar with this technique, you can think of it as how many friends do you have on Facebook? It doesn't matter who your friends are, but how many do you have? And we can use this as a measure of how connected you are, are you to the world. Well, we can do the same thing with the brain. We can say every voxel in the brain, how connected are you with the rest of the brain? I don't care who you're connected to, but how connected are you? And red means more connected, blue means less connected. And you can again see here with this different analysis analysis that the posterior cingulate is less connected with the rest of the brain. Now people are meditating, but the posterior cingulate is not connecting to the rest of the brain. It's deactivating and it's not connecting to the rest of the brain in experienced meditators. So I think we can, we can go to Richard Feynman here who says, you know, you're the, science is a way of trying not to fool yourself. The first principle is that you must not fool yourself, and you are the easiest person to fool. Sure, we want to see, we want to see results that fit with the theory, you know, yet this is a selfless practice. But we really, you know, we want to be rigorous and be careful so that we don't uh, fool ourselves. So how do we confirm our findings? Typically, we correlate these with self-report. Now, this can be uh, difficult because even during long, we're calling these long periods of meditation, so typically hey, we had people meditate for four minutes in the scanner. But there can be memory bias and there can also be subjective bias. A meditator might say, well, my mind wandered three times and that was a lot. And, it, and a novice could be like, oh, my mind didn't wander at all. And they didn't notice that they were lost the whole time. So we might be able to reduce bias by providing real-time feedback while people are meditating. So what do I mean by this? We can give them the same task and we can have them meditate. But now that we've got brain regions to go after, we can actually give them active feedback during meditation. Um, and we can also give them feedback from different regions so we can control for them just telling us what they think we want to hear. And what this looks like in the scanner, we're using the posterior cingulate here as a region of interest. This, the activity of their brain gets calculated every two seconds. So you can scan their entire brain every two seconds and we can plot it out on a graph. And red here is increased activity and blue here is decreased activity. And we can ask people to just meditate and from time to time, so they can increase their temporal resolution, we can ask them from time to time to check in with the graph and see if it correlates with their experience. So when it was red, was this related to self-referential activity? When it's blue, did it correlate with concentration? And what I can say is with novices and experienced meditators, both rated, uh, I think it was roughly 8 to 9 out of 10 on, their, um, on how well it correlated. And um, what I can also show, so you can see here in a novice in a couple of runs, they see a lot of red and a lot of blue. In experienced meditators, we saw a very different pattern. And this isn't something you need statistics um, to determine that they're different. So this was really striking to us. But even more striking, we have some people that don't follow directions. And so here's an experienced meditator. And she reported, so we ask people after each run what happened. And she reported run one is interesting because after several minutes of blue, I wondered if this paradigm actually did measure self-referential processing. So I effortfully broke the period of resting and awareness and generated a sense of self by saying her name over and over and over. She said, this produced a large red spike at the end of the run. Okay, it works. Interesting. She said, on run six, a, a familiar memory image appeared, one of a pond, willow tree, and fields of my parents' farm. I noticed the strong red deflection in response to this, although they don't appear in the image. I went back to the image to see if there was a sense of watch or subject and noticed the image had a sense of being seen through a child's eyes. The somewhat desolate feeling landscape corresponds to the child's subjectivity. So there is a subject there, even though I never noticed it before. The scanner feedback made me look for it. If you look at run six, you can see me exploring the image in a long red of run in the middle. Then I remembered I wasn't doing the task, so I let go for a while. Then I started imagining myself in the future telling Judd about what I discovered about childhood memories, <laughs> which you can clearly see in the second run of red at the end of run six. She said, I'm sorry that I blew off the directions, but I learned something new and very subtle about those recurring memory images that I've had for more than a decade, something I may not have learned otherwise. 
So we can start to use this feedback as a way to get at individual variability within a run. I'm just going to show you a few more examples very, very quickly. So here's an experienced meditator doing concentration meditation, and here's one same person doing loving kindness meditation, and you can see the uh, tremendous amount of variability within this run. Well, what he reported was his, his loving kindness practice really got started toward the end of the run. Thank you. And I'm just going to, sh and so we can, we can argue here, you know, again, this is confirming that the self is optional for these practices. I'm just going to show one more very quickly, somebody doing Tong Len meditation for a friend and then for a significant other. And he said, oh. <laughs> so I'm just going to summarize. Just summarize quickly, it seems that the posterior cingulate in particular is part of the default mode network, and there's a lot of other research besides ours, that's, ours that supports this, may be uh, a good target for meditation. And it also seems that decreased intrinsic connectivity may be, um, may be it, the case for loving kindness as well. And we can start to use real-time feedback as a way for confirming results, capturing variability within task blocks, and also pointing as out aspects of experience. So this is a, an emerging field uh, described as neurophenomenology that was originally um, pr uh, proposed by Francisco, Francisco Varela, among others. And so just really quickly, I'm eight seconds over time, um, if compassion meditation is a selfless practice, we can ask ourselves a few questions. Should it, with practice, decrease posterior cingulate activity like many other meditations are, are being shown to do? And does this differentiate true, em true, true compassion from empathy, where uh, empathy might be a more self-referential process? These are hypotheses that we can test. And also, can we start to use neurofeedback as a tool for example, using the posterior cingulate, but many other brain regions may be involved as well, for helping individuals learn to practice. And we can follow, we can follow empathies, do, or follow outcomes. Does this correlate with decreased empathy, fatigue, um, increased prosocial behavior, et cetera? So I'll stop there uh, just with a Shanti Deva quote that you can read in four seconds. And thank everyone for listening. And, um, and, thank, and I will finish there. Thank you very much.